Are you willing to cross the Jordan River? For the experience of the Hebrews, there was nothing so desired than to cross the Jordan River into the land of Canaan. And as ancient Israel is a type, is a shadow of things to come, it is undoubted to say that the Jordan River is the last experience of trouble that this world will pass through before the saints enter into glory. And there is a prophecy of a condition within the church just before the close of probation. Would you like to know what that prophecy is? Would you like to know what the prophet of the Lord says will be just before the close of probation? I read here from Voice and Speech and Song, page 400. And 17. It says, the things that have, that have dis- sorry, the things you have described as taking place in Indiana, the Lord has shown me would take place just before the close of probation. Every uncouth thing will be demonstrated. There will be shouting with drums. Music and dancing. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. And this is called the moving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never reveals itself in such methods, in such a bedlam of noise. It is an invitation of Satan to cover up his sorry it is an invention of satan to cover up his ingenious methods of making of none effect the pure sincere elevating ennobling sanctifying truths for this time better never have the worship of god blend with music than to use musical instruments to do the work which last january was represented to me would be brought into our camp meetings. The truth for this time needs nothing of this kind. It is the work of, co- of converting souls. A bedlam of noise shocks the senses and perverts that which, if conducted aright, might be a blessing. The powers of satanic agencies blend with the din and noise and have a carnival. And this is termed the Holy Spirit's working. So just before the close of probation, in the camp meetings, there will be shouting, drums, and dancing. And this will be termed the moving of the Holy Spirit. Music that is wrongly called Pentecostal, it has nothing to do with Pentecost, but that is what it's being called. It's called the working of the Holy Spirit because the human gets a, a sensational feeling from such music. And it's very easy to break into a state of tear, of crying. And... All this is deemed as if I'm letting Jesus into my heart. And the worship today is largely consisted of music. The preaching is reduced down to 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and the music takes such large time. And then when anyone preaches a sermon for half an hour, that's too long, let alone an hour, let alone an hour and 15 minutes. This is what will take just before the close of probation. Is it just before the close of probation? Does that mean we should have drums in our church now and some dancing with it? No. This is the state of God's church that has rejected the messages that he has sent to them. 
And I believe that majority of us here would not consider having shouting and dancing and drums amongst us. But there's another description here that I believe does affect us. And that is that everything uncouth will be demonstrated. The word uncouth simply means unrefined, low-grade and vulgar. And from the same book, Voice and Speech and Song, page 46, paragraph 1, the Spirit of Prophecy says, the, work, the workmen for God should make earnest efforts to become representatives of Christ, discarding all uncommonly sorry, discarding all uncomely gestures and uncouth speech. This was one description, along with music and drums and dancing and, and shouting, this characteristic of being uncouth will also be rampant in our day. And this needs to not be amongst God's people. Because there is unrefined, low-grade, vulgar talking. Describing natural occurrences of the human body in detail. And then people laugh about it. That's uncouth. Or even the young people, when a child would pass wind, the young people laugh. Is that uncouth? That's uncouth. In fact, the children don't even know because of such is the kingdom of heaven. It's just a function of the body that happens. And then the adults will laugh. And what does that teach the children? That it's funny. And is it funny? It's not funny at all. This condition will exist just before the close of probation. The scripture says that we should keep our tongues from evil and from our lips from speaking guile. Common, cheap expressions should be replaced by sound, pure words, by constant watchfulness and earnest discipline. The Christian youth may keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. Guile is simply fraud or deception because if we can talk about such low-grade things and yet with the same mouth praise the Lord... That's guile. Because can a mouth bring forth bitter and sweet? Can we engage in low-grade things as well as high-grade things? Not at all. And it's written of the 144,000 that they stand without fault before the throne of God, having no guile in their mouth. Peter, the Apostle Peter, was known by his speech because he had spent time with Jesus. And when we'd spend time with Jesus, our speech becomes purified. And the Lord heavily rebuked me because my speech fails. The slang terms that I grew up with still linger about, and the Lord said, They have to stop. Not just low grade, but just slaying words, common cheap talk, needs to stop among God's people. But that's not what I was going to talk to you about today. I want to share with you today, in regards to the close of probation, the time of people, the type of people that will be living as a large majority is found in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1.
2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Can you imagine having a pleasure-loving, high-minded, proud, disobedient, heady, which simply means a, a defiant disregard to consequences, that's what it means to be heady. Self-loving, fierce, incontinent or unable to control themselves. Religious person. If you were to rebuke such a person, what would happen? <laughs> From such turn away. And Laodicea is in a condition that lives in this perilous times. And Jesus says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And do you think such a generation that love themselves, that are high-minded, proud, fierce, can't control themselves, but yet they're religious, do you think they'll appreciate the love of God? Not at all. In fact, they reject the light because it says in 1 John chapter 3, which we read last week, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20. Sorry, not 1 John, the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John chapter 3 and verse 20. For everyone that doth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. We try and avoid things because we don't like the rebuke. We let the spirit of prophecy go dusty on our shelves because we don't like the rebuke it gives. So we don't come to the light. This is the condition that we're dealing with in the time of Laodicea. That the rebuke which is given in love is not interpreted as love and is avoided. But if you turn with me to Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon chapter 5, Verse 2, it speaks of God's people and his knocking at the heart, as we read it last week in, in the letter to the Laodiceans, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Song of Solomon, chapter 5 and verse 2, it says, I sleep, but my heart awaketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of night. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? My beloved put his hand by the hole of the door and my bowels were moved for him. I arose up to my beloved and my hands dropped with myrrh and my fingers with sweet smelling myrrh. Upon the handles of the lock. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul fainted when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. Sad story. But it's a story of us today. The Lord is knocking at the heart's door and we are so in tune with sentimentalism that we deem everything that he does is just so lovely that we can't even open the door. But we read in Desire of Ages, 
page 489, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Every warning, reproof, entreaty in the word of God or through his messengers is a knock at the door of the heart. It is the voice of Jesus asking for entrance. With every knock unheeded, the disposition to open becomes weaker. The impressions of the Holy Spirit, if disregarded today, will not be as strong tomorrow. So here is a woman who hears the knocking. Oh, so lovely. And in the, the lovesick sentimentalism comes the inability to open the door to Jesus and receive him. And finally, when there is a need to open the door, Jesus is already gone. Jesus talks about the last days and says, It shall be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps, and, and they all slept. But there is a class of people who do not wake up in time. And they wake up, and they go, Okay, Lord, I want to serve you now. Too late. It's too late. And they run around the street saying, where is he? Yeah, I heard the rebuke. And it's interesting that there are a class of people that actually enjoy a rebuke sometimes. You know, you get some of those hellfire preachers and they'll get a crowd of people because it's, it's quite hard. But yet, do they open the door to the rebuke individually? That is the question. Because as that time comes and the woman goes out to the streets, she ends up being raped. And this is the scenario of what we're living in today. The Lord is knocking at our hearts, trying to get us to reform our lives, to cease from doing things that aren't pleasing in His sight. And we don't respond quick enough. Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7. Isaiah chapter 5, uh, sorry, 55. Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7. It states, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will save and he'll, he'll have mercy upon him. And to our God for he will abundantly pardon. There comes a time where there is the close of probationary time. Where you can open the door but you won't find him anymore. And thus it says, call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways. Change while you can, my friends, before it's too late. And never get bitter about a rebuke. Because if we get bitter about a rebuke, we receive the grace of God in vain. Because that's what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, speaking of... That chapter that we dealt with last week, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be wearied when thou art rebuked of him. We read further down from that portion in Hebrews chapter 12. It states in verse 15, Look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. What's this scripture talking about? It's talking about the close of Esau's probation. He was a rough man, he was a hunter. 
But yet he was meant to receive a blessing. He was the firstborn. And he could have received the blessing. There's no reason why he couldn't have. But in his roughness, his frankness, which he probably thought as a virtue, he got into himself into a position that he couldn't get out of. And though he sought it with tears, he sought repentance, but he couldn't find it because the Lord had gone from him. The Bible always shows two classes of people. There is only two classes of people. The Lord Jesus gives the illustration of sheep and goats. Well, there's the Cain and the Abel. There's the Isaac, the Ishmael. There's the Jacob, the Esau. All these depict the two classes that this world will find themselves in. We're either going to be sorry, but sorry too late, or we're going to wrestle with the angel all night and prevail. Because if we receive the grace of God in vain, that means the rebukes that God gives us, we fob off. We say, it's not for me. Or we brood over them and get really bitter about them, and we spoil ourselves and other people are spoiled also over that same thing. Brewing over the problems. But read with me in Titus, which we read last week. But Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. And it says, for the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Jesus Christ gave himself for us so we would become pure. Not so we can stay in our sins. Not that we can still be uncouth. Not, that we don't, um, not so we can engage in worldly conversation. Jesus Christ gave himself so we could become pure. Pure in everything we do, including our speech. Because it is written that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Esau was profane, which simply means unsanctified, unholy and dirty. Is any of our speech profane? Unholy, dirty. And in all this, the Lord is rebuking his people. And the Lord is trying to woo his people through the spirit of prophecy. And the church has slowly rejected or made of none effect the spirit of prophecy. And because of the rejection of light, we become in a state that Esau finds himself in. But this is not the only case that we can find ourselves in. We can also find ourselves in a position where we become weary, where we get tired. And this is one concerning thing that I have, is that we get tired of the trials which we go through. A 
trial comes, or a rebuke, not just rebukes, but even trials, providence that the Lord sends, and things go bad, how do we cope with them? You know, when something negative just bursts itself upon your life, do you get really down and discouraged about things? Do you go under a cloud, get discouraged? I fear that we do too much. Things try us, and for the rest of the day, or two days, or three days, we're just dragging our lip on the ground. Let us turn to our scripture reading in Jeremiah chapter 12. And Jeremiah chapter 12 begins with Jeremiah talking to the Lord about his trials. And there's nothing wrong with talking to the Lord about the trials. But notice what the Lord has to say to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 12. And verse 5, but you can read from 5. He's asking why all these bad things are happening. All this negativity, persecution, and betrayal of trust, and everything's going bad. And he's telling the Lord, and the Lord says, in verse 5, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, how then canst thou contend? With the horses. You know, if you, he's just saying, okay, you've got some problems, it's sad. But if you're getting a hard time over this, how are you going to cope in the future? If we go under the cloud over the little things, how will we survive in the bigger things? It continues and it says, he, Jesus, the Lord asks the same question. And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trusted, they wearied thee. Then, how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? You know, we get cast down. Circumstances happen to us. We're thinking, wow, why did that ha happen again? We've got to consider, how do we actually deal with it? Is it really pulling us down? Because the Lord's asking you the question, if that is going to make you tired, how are you going to cope in the future to come? You know, aren't we living in the land of peace? We are. And do we get weary? Do we get tired of our life? Do we think these trials never stop? Well, there's more to come. Much more to come. As much as a horse is compared to a running man, a running horse compared to a running man is two big different things. And so it is with the trials of the present day, with what is going to be coming shortly upon the earth. And the Lord is asking the question. And this question I find very practical because it says, how will thou do? See, the word do is a practical word. What are you going to do? Not what are you going to think? Not what do you imagine? What are you going to do? Very practical question. But it's not just a practical question. It's also a personal question because it says, how will thou do? Not how your neighbor's going to do, not how your best friend's going to do, not how your wife's going to do. How are you going to do? And this question also has more than that. It has a weighty reality in the swelling of Jordan. Our own city has just been flooded by the swelling of the Brisbane River. And how do we do? How do many people do? It's a big burden. But this is just physical river. If this burdens us, this catastrophe that is coming, such as never was since there was a nation, how will you cope in that time if we're burdened under the trials we have today? This is what God is asking you. You know, we often are ready to pull our hair out because we've had so much stress. We've had so much problems. We've it's coming up to our neck. But this problem that we have is going to come to every single person, Jacob and Esau. Read with me in Jeremiah chapter 49. Because this time is a time of temptation, the hour of temptation which will come upon the earth to try men as it's written in in Revelation chapter 3. 
Jeremiah 49. Starting in verse 8. Flee ye, turn back, dwell deep, O inhabitants of Dedan. For I will bring the calamity of Esau upon him, the time that I will visit him. Verse 10. I have made Esau bare. I have uncovered his secret parts, and he shall not be able to hide himself. His seed, his seed is spoiled, and his brethren and his neighbors, and he is not. What's that talking about? The calamity of Esau. What was the calamity of Esau? He went through a difficulty and then he wanted to repent from it. The problem was with Esau's repentance was he was sorry because he was suffering. Not because it was wrong. And there are so many people when we get into the, into the negativity or the consequences of what we have done, then we're sorry. But is that true sorriness? No. No. Because the dog, when it eats something and wants to vomit, it's very sorry that he ate what he ate. And so the dog will vomit everything out, but five minutes later the dog laps up its vomit again. And so it is with Esau. He is sorry because he is suffering. When the suffering is gone, he will go back and do it again. This calamity will come upon the world that reject the answers. From Jesus Christ. And all the naked parts of Esau will be revealed. He'll become naked. All the secret parts. This is none other than the investigative judgment. And it is a reality that our sins will be opened. Everything that we have done wrong will be opened. And in this trial, it says in verse 10 of Jeremiah 49, uh, we read verse 10, but also in verse 17, it says, As Edom, and Edom is simply the land of Esau, okay? As also Edom shall be a desolation. Everyone that goeth by it shall be astonished and shall hiss at the plagues. Thereof, as in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighbour cities thereof, shall the, saith the Lord, no man shall abide there, neither shall a man, a son of man, dwell in it. So saying, as Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, so is the land of Esau going to be destroyed. And Sodom and Gomorrah were simply a type of the destruction of the world. And then it says, Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the swelling of what? He shall come up like a lion from the swelling of Jordan against the inhabitations of the strong. But I will suddenly make him run away from her. And who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her? For who is like me? And who will appoint me the time? And who is the shepherd that will stand before me? Good questions. There's going to be a lion that will come out from the swelling of Jordan to devour the strong God's people. But God says, I will suddenly make her run away from her. So there will be a threat of death. There will be a, a overwhelming Trouble that will come out from the swelling of Jordan, even against the strong, even against Jacob. Because it's written of Jacob that he wrestled all night and prevailed against God. That's the strength it's talking about. Even the strong in the Lord will have a hard time. So how will you fare? You need to make a decision... Of what side 
you want to end up on? Do you want to deal with the situations now? Do you want to learn how to cope with the stresses now? Do you want to learn how to not go into discouragement now? We'll be overwhelmed then. Obadiah chapter 1 verse 15 to 18. Obadiah chapter 1, 15 to 18. It says, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. It's the same description that Revelation chapter 18 talks about Babylon. Reward her even as she rewarded you. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions and the house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame and the house of Esau for stubble and they shall kindle in them and devour them and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau for the Lord hath spoken it. You'll be gone. In other words, this swelling of Jordan is going to take away all those that are not founded Upon the rock, Jesus Christ. All those that have not dealt with their sins through the atonement of Jesus Christ. This water will sweep them all away. Therefore, if we're suffering under the trials we have today, will we get swept away then? Will we get swept away then? 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning, concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. You know why we get discouraged when trials come? Because we don't know what's happening. We can't see beyond the trial. And the Bible is saying simply to us, today, the trials we have right now, don't think it strange. Don't go, ooh, what happened? Don't scratch your head and go, why is this happening? It says, but rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with exceeding joy. So in the trial, we are to directly take our mind away from the trial and look at what it will bring. We must dwell upon that right at the time it's happening. Not two days later and say, oh yeah, well, that's of course. Right when it happens, we must do this. And then it says, but, sorry, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of. But on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Do we like to stick our beak in other men's matters? We stick our beak in other men's matters and we get slapped for that. And we go, oh, what happened? They're persecuting me. That's not persecution. You deserved it. And so what it's saying is, when we go through trials, don't let it be the trial of an unconfessed sin. Don't suffer like a murderer. Because Esau will suffer too. And often we read, well, we suffer for Christ. And just because any old suffering comes along, we think, well, that's for Christ. We're suffering for Christ. Yet half of the suffering 
isn't even for Christ. It's because you actually actually did wrong. Let us not suffer like Esau, like a murderer. If we have done things wrong, let us confess our sins and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But does that excuse any trial? No, the trial then is not a punishment of the sin that Jesus took, but it is a process that will refine you. That's what it is. So we want to understand where our trials are coming from. And if they're coming from I've confessed the sin. Sure, I've done things wrong, but I want to give it up. And we give it up, and then we suffer. Don't think it's strange. Don't say, well, I should be in the land of bliss. And then it says, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come, That judgment must begin at the house of God and it first begin at us. What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? You know, if this flood of of Jordan that has to be passed before Canaan is ever entered to sweeps away most of the people and the righteous struggle... What's going to happen to those that don't even care about it? It's going to really wreak havoc. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. See some answers there? We're suffering, trials, providences that we never asked for, things that just happened. We've tried to prevent them, but they've come again and they stress us out. And we go home and we're all perplexed about what's happening. We need to commit it to God and consider not so much the circumstance, but what it's doing in me. Even if I can't see it's doing anything, we read, think, it not strange. And then we read in fifth, um, manuscript releases, 15 manuscript releases, page 331. And it states this. And I'm reading a little bit below it and then I'm reading up above it. Just the way it, it says, Sister B, and I believe that it can be all of us. We all must exercise faith and wipe the disagreeable frown from our brow and rather have it lightened up with the Spirit of God. Patience and endurance will effect a great work. Okay, we've got the trial. And what's going to affect, you know, cause to affect? What is something's going to happen and there's going to be a great work as a result, as the effect of it? What is it? Patience and endurance will affect great work. A little difficulty or trial casts them down. Instead of developing character and enduring trial and bearing with courage and perseverance, They sink under the cloud, said the angel. If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how how canst thou contend with the horses? And if the land of peace, wherein thou trusteth, they have wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? The time of trouble is before us, and if there is a lack of courage and ambition now, How will they pass the fearful scenes of that trying hour? What do we need? Courage and ambition. Remember when the world engage in some business, some ambitious person, and some businesses are very hard to build up. It takes a lot of mental energy, and there are a thousand discouragements that come across the way. And there would be a thousand times that someone would say, oh, give up. But what is needed is an ambition and a a courage 
that will just press on. That's what we need. Though a thousand fall at my right hand and ten thousand by my left hand, we're moving on. Determination. And that determination, we'll see where it comes from. But it says, Some make their lives almost useless by thinking they are more afflicted than they really are. The Lord calls for a reform. And again, that is what a class of people today do heavily. The emos. Poor me. I am so hard done by. I have so many trials. Poor me. And then they become useless in this world. But the Lord is saying, we need a determination that whatever comes our way, I want one thing and one thing only. One thing I desire of the Lord. And that will I seek after. Is that your answer? Will you do that? Do you want one thing to desire or do you want 20 things that you desire? You know, when man really desires something, they can do it. You know, the sportsmen, they want to win. That's their desire and they do it. And if they lose one race, do they stop? No, they keep at it. And yet, Christians, trials, too hard, sorry. I'll take the popular doctrine that puts me to sleep. We need this determination. But where does this determination come from? 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. And it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Remember that grace is something that teaches. Grace also delivers rebukes. But peace as well. Grace and peace be multiplied Unto you, through how? How does this happen? Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. The knowledge that we have of our God is the thing that can give us the ambition and energy to keep going. If we fail to see God in every circumstance of our life and see His hand, Although mysterious though it be, if we acknowledge his leading and we yield to his counsel, then he will give us the strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Let us look at Hebrews chapter 12 again. Hebrews chapter 12 and let us look at Jesus because we need to have a knowledge of Him, knowledge of Jesus Christ and of God and what they're doing to save us. And then when we know what they're doing and things come to us, we know exactly what's going on. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Who? For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself lest you be wearied and faint in your minds you have not resisted unto blood striving against sin consider him lest you become weary what makes us tired in our trials even now in the land of peace what makes us weary of the trials i get tired of things we aren't looking to jesus and that means to see the sufferings of Jesus Christ in relation to my circumstance. Not just have a picture on the wall and just look at the picture. It's to identify him in my circumstance. And as I consider him, then I won't be weary and I won't faint in my mind. 
I won't, be, I won't drown in the flood, but we will have to go through the flood. And when we identify what's going on, we will have a life that people won't understand. Because it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Do you know what that means? The word judge simply means discern. In other words, he that is spiritual discerns all things. If we are spiritual, truly, if we have been looking to Jesus Christ and we have a circumstance in our life, will we discern what's going on? All things will be discerned. Yet, it says, but we're discerned of no man. In other words, people scratch their head and go, how can they get through all that? They can't discern it because spiritual things are spiritually discerned because that's what it said there in the text before. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. It's not meaning that if you're spiritual you can go and judge everybody in the way of judgment seat. It's simply discerning everything that is in your experience and yet no one else can see it. And then it says, For we have known the mind of the Lord. Sorry, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Do any of you feel that you can instruct the Lord how to run your life? Who has known the Lord's ways in, so you can tell him what to do? How can you tell the Lord what your life needs to be like? But we have the mind of Christ in that we will discern everything that God gives to us. In Hosea chapter 6 and verse 1 to 3, we will know him by his method. We will identify our God by the way in which he conducts himself. And this is what the latter rain is actually meant to do. Do you believe that? The latter rain? Read with me in in, um, Hosea chapter 6 and verse 1 to 3. Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. Does our God tear us? Does your God tear you? Do you know that or not? When you go through a tearing experience, do you know that that's God or not? He, this is the knowledge of God. This is what gives us peace. He will tear us. He hath torn us and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days, will he revive us? In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain upon the earth. So it's simply saying, come let us return to the Lord because he is the one that smites us. He is the one that is disciplining us and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And in the third day, he will raise us up. Does that sound like somebody? Jesus Christ, his own son, smitten, laid in the grave. And in that grave on the Sabbath day, he was revived. And then on the third day, he was raised up. If we will follow on to know the Lord, we will then know his goings forth is prepared as the morning. And then the latter rain will have its effect on the heart. Do we follow on? Do we go through the trial and then say, yes, Lord, I identify what you're doing here? Or, 
Lord, I don't identify what you're doing here, but I know it's you because you're my God and I'm going to rest in you as a faithful creator and I'm going to keep going with you. If we keep going, then we will know that his goings forth is prepared at the morning. If we go through a trial and say, forget this, this is too hard, I want to throw, all the, uh, I want to just throw everything in now, will you ever know what, is prepared, what, he, what he is prepared for you in your life? You'll never know. Because you've turned your back on him. And you just become bitter. If you get rebuked, and you hang on to that rebuke, and say, okay, Lord, if this is what you said, fair enough, let's go with it, and follow on to know the Lord, you'll find that your life will change. But too often, we throw it all out, because it's too hard. He will bind us up. He will heal us, just like he did Jesus on the cross, and if we know him, then our problems, at least the trial that burns within us, decreases as we identify him. Psalm 69. Jesus went through this cross after three days. This is during the day that he was being smitten. He was afflicted. In Psalm 69, verse 1, Save me, O God, for the waters are come into my soul. Sound like you're crossing a river? Save me, O God, for the waters are come into my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters and the floods overflow me what do you think it's going to be like when you cross Jordan in flood do you think you're going to get wet do you think your hair is going to get wet everything's going to get wet and you're going to feel like I'm sinking I'm going away Lord help me this is what happened to Jesus on the cross read with me I am weary of my crying my throat is dried my eyes fail while I wait for my God wow this is a hard experience this is the swelling of Jordan if we have this experience in the little trials of life, then how are we going to cope in the swelling of Jordan? No doubt, swelling of Jordan is going to be a hard time. There's nothing light about it, but we need to prepare for it. And then it goes on in verse, um, uh, verse 4. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies, wrongfully are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. O God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. And then, in verse 12, They sit at the gate. They that sit in the gate speak against me that I was the song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of thy mercies. Hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Deliver me out of the mire. Let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, and hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw nigh unto my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of mine enemies. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before me. Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. Do you look for some to take pity in your trials? There will be no apparent help in the swelling of Jordan. Simply Jacob's trouble. It says... 
reproach hath broken my heart. I am full of heaviness, and I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Who is that? Jesus Christ. When he bore our sins in his body on the tree, he identified himself and says, My sins are more than the hairs of my head. They're all before me. I know my foolishness. He was confessing our sins. He didn't sin. But he was in the state where God was going. Everybody around him went. His disciples fled. He had nobody. And he cried out to the Lord, Help me. The floods are coming in. Don't let them swallow me up. I'm drowning. He's underwater. What does God say that he will do with your sins? He'll cast them where? He'll cast them into the depths of the sea. Do you realize that Jesus was cast into the depths? Because who took your sins? Jesus Christ. When we gave our sins to Jesus, God took them in him and plunged them into the depths of the sea. And in that experience was the swelling of Jordan for him. And it is for us, that cup that we are to drink, as we read in Obadiah um, chapter 1. It says, As they have drunk on my holy hill, so shall the heathen drink. What drink did Jesus drink on the hill of Jerusalem? Father, if it be possible, let not this cup pass from me. You know that same cup? The wicked will have to drink, but there's no remedy in it. The wine of Babylon, the plagues are the cups. And they have to be poured out upon the inhabitants of the earth. They have to drink and go down and be swallowed. The only difference is that the righteous will come through it, will not drown in it because of their knowledge of God. Because read with me in verse 27, it says, Add iniquity unto their iniquity and let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them not... Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me up on high. I will praise the name of God with a, with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bullock that hath horns and hoofs. The humble shall see this and be glad. Do you see it? Do you see in Jesus Christ him passing through the swelling of Jordan? If we go through and we see him, they shall, the humble shall see it and be glad. In the middle of drowning, you're going to be glad because God will save you. And it says, and your heart shall live that seek God. For the Lord heareth the poor and despises not his prisoners. Let the heaven and earth praise his name, the seas and everything that moves. For God will save Zion. He will build the cities of Judah and that they may dwell there and have in it possession. The seed also of his servants shall inherit it. And they that love his name shall dwell therein. Do you see the mind of Jesus going through the difficulty? But yet I'm going to praise the Lord in all this circumstance because he will hear because he has said so. And to close with, there is two texts I'd like us to dwell upon. And this comes to enlarge a little bit more the answer of how to, to cope with the trials of today in order to cope with the trial to come. In Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 8 to 11. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Okay, this is the Christian belief. If we're going to be dead with him, then we're going to be living with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. 
but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise. Okay? Likewise. Jesus died to sin. And now he's living. Likewise, if we die under the waters of baptism, we do the form of baptism, but are we prepared to go through that swelling of Jordan? To be baptized truly with the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It says, likewise, reckon yourselves also, ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Reckon. What do you reckon? Do you reckon that you're dead? Or do you not reckon? What do you reckon? What does reckon mean? It's a mind exercise. That I need to reckon something. I need to have a mindset in a certain circumstance. And that mindset is that Jesus suffered and now is living. I will suffer and I will live also. Do you reckon that? Because Romans chapter 8, verse 18, is what Paul reckoned. And I reckon the same. And I hope you reckon also. It says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Do you reckon that? So if you reckon that the sufferings today are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall become, well, where's your problem? I'd say, I reckon you don't have a problem. But do you reckon you have a problem? Or do you reckon that the sufferings of Christ and the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be even compared with it? I pray that we can reckon this. Because if we reckon this, then we will have no problems. Our problems will all be stepping stones, all the difficulties that we find will be the steps of the ladder and we will love them. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. Don't think it strange concerning the trials today. And then you can have a hope of coping with the swelling of Jordan. I pray that we all, as a company, can cope with the horses and the swelling of Jordan. Amen.